We're here with our friend Julie Kelly, who is a very serious reporter. We have enormous respect for her. Julie Kelly, you broke this story of this information that was released today. Tell us what you found. So, Mark, thanks again for having me on. This is related to, again, Judge Aileen Cannon's crusade to unseal and unredact as much information related to this corrupt case as she possibly can. So this was a motion by Donald Trump to suppress the evidence collected during the Mar-a-Lago raid in August of 2022. One of the exhibits that was attached to that motion is the FBI's what they call operational order related to how the FBI raid would be conducted. And part of this included a policy statement, use of deadly force, um, attached to this plan that instructs agents how and when they can use deadly force during an FBI raid. Mm. And there were other details that were disclosed, also caveats as to how agents should continue if the former president showed up at Mar-a-Lago during the raid. Of course, he was at the time his summer residence in Bedminster, how they would negotiate if Secret Service agents resisted the raid. Uh, Also a medic that had been embedded in the FBI raid team and directions as to how to get to a trauma center 18 miles away from Mar-a-Lago if anyone was injured during this raid. So they were ready for a full-out armed conflict. That's what you're telling me. This is what the documents released today indicate. And this is was noted in the motion to suppress the evidence during the Mar-a-Lago raid. They have many issues with how this raid was conducted, the affidavit, the application for the search warrant, that it was based on false premises and false information. And this is part of it just disclosing how the FBI prepared to conduct this armed nine-hour raid of Mar-a-Lago, which also disclosed today, Mark, that agents rifled through, this is not a joke, I know people say, oh, Melania's underwear drawer. There are several exhibits that indicate that agents were in Melania's private suite taking photographs of I don't know what, but there's dozens of entries in the FBI's photographical log of what happened. They also went through a child's room. We can only assume that it's Barron's room. So what exactly were these 30 plus armed FBI agents, also an official from the DOJ counterintelligence unit, also an individual from the FBI headquarters, what what were they doing? What were they looking for, Mark? They weren't looking for papers that had classified markings on them. The entire premise for all of this, as we've known, is a lie. It was about optics. And it could be, some speculate, looking for Donald Trump's copies of the Crossfire Hurricane records. But this is egregious. It, it's mind-blowing. And I'll tell you what, Mark, there are people out there actually defending this. Former federal prosecutors and former FBI agents who say, well, of course, this is standard operating procedure to have a deadly force oh guidance God. included in this plan. Uh, it, there's no defense of this, Mark. Against the no former problem. president? There's, there's, plenty of that, there's plenty of precedent? There's no precedent. And that, Julie Kelly, just so the American people understand, as somebody who worked as chief of staff to an attorney general, he would never have authorized the FBI or the U.S. attorney or special counsel to go into a court and to seek a warrant in the first place. He would have picked up the damn phone. He would have called, let's say it was Biden, and said, look, give us the stuff. I'm under pressure, something like that. They took no middle steps, even though they pretend they did. And look at what they could have created here. And I want to say this to you as well. ABC News says the big story here, Julie, is that there were other classified documents in the bed. Who cares? He turned them over. Who cares? The same Department of Justice that has mishandled the very classified documents for which Donald Trump is being prosecuted, right? Correct. So we now know, and you and I talked about this last week, is that Jack Smith had to come out and confess to Judge Cannon and the court 
that the FBI investigators mishandled evidence collected after the raid. They told the court that all of the evidence was in the proper sequence, the initial sequence that it was after the raid. That is not the case. Furthermore, they brought those cover sheets that you and I talked about, the cover sheets that they planted on top of who knows what files to take that infamous picture that made it look like Trump was hoarding all these classified documents and wasn't turning them over. That was also part of this raid. And Jack Smith also had to admit that the placeholder sheets that they put when they had to take out an alleged classified document that they found at Mar-a-Lago, that those placeholder sheets, some of them, they can't match up with the classified documents that they took out of these boxes. And so ABC News, what, now we're supposed to be concerned that the FBI claims that there were other papers found throughout Mar-a-Lago. That for which, by the way, for which, for which President Trump was in charge with obstruction on those. And yet ABC leads with that. We're with Julie Kelly, who's just fantastic. There's really nobody who's covering this. January 6th, the Trump cases, particularly the federal cases, the document January 6th case like she is. Uh, Julie Kelly, uh, you looked at these documents that were released. Again, as an old Justice Department official, you have a Justice Department that's used to handling millions and tens of millions of pages of documents in big antitrust cases. I remember the IBM case, the AT&T case, you had the Microsoft case. They have systems set up. They have individuals who have a full-time job to, to track the documents, to mark the documents. They have... Uh, Places in the Department of Justice, a big vault room where we put documents and so forth and so on. Here you have a case of a former president of the United States who's running for president. And your case focuses on these documents and the idea that these were accidentally mishandled or or we didn't have the right people handling them and it's just cover sheets. I don't believe it for two seconds. Does it make sense to you? None of it makes sense. Of course not. Um, This was all a stunt. It was a stunt for publicity to make it look like Donald Trump was a criminal. So they had all the optics of the FBI raid that he's hoarding nuclear secrets. He's going to share them with our country's enemies, that he obstructed the investigation. Then we know that they added these props, these cover sheets. We know now that they rummaged through Melania's room and Barron's room. And they ended up with what, 102, they say, papers with classified markings. But now we realize this could have really escalated to a dangerous situation. If President Trump had gone to Mar-a-Lago with news that the FBI was there raiding his residence, they had contingencies as to how the FBI agents were supposed to conduct themselves. What if the Secret Service would have resisted the armed FBI agents raid of a former president's home. What would have happened then? So now we have more, your imagination can go wild. Mm -hmm. We're lucky, and obviously Donald Trump and his family and the staffers at Mar-a-Lago. Mark, they actually had plans how to go door to door. That's what they said, door to door at Mar-a-Lago, the guest rooms there to interrogate guests for what? classify documents. So what really was this all about? And this is why it's so important and so courageous of Judge Cannon to be releasing and posting these unsealed files now. She actually today authorized the unsealing of 10 more motions from earlier in the case. I will be at the courthouse tomorrow, Mark, for a hearing on Walt Nada, Trump's longtime personal aide, who's also a co-defendant, his motion to dismiss based on selective and vindictive prosecution. Because we also know, Mark, thank you to Judge Cannon, that um, Walt Nauta's attorney was threatened by Jay Bratt, the DOJ's lead prosecutor, Mm -hmm. that he would torpedo the lawyer's judicial nomination if he did not successfully get Walt Nauta, a longtime aide, a naval veteran, to flip on Trump. And, be co- and cooperate with the government. And that's never been resolved, has it? It it's has never not. been resolved. I think, be, I think it'll be part of the hearing tomorrow. And Jay Brown will be there, and so will Stanley Woodward, Walt Nauta's attorney. 
Stan Woodward is the lawyer who has said that this guy threatened him with his judgeship, potential judgeship. Now, that, of course, would be a crime. And he stays on the, the, uh, the, the, the Jack Smith staff and so forth and so on. And judge, this judge is being attacked even tonight by ABC News. In the last paragraph, she's controversial. Legal experts question that. No, she's not controversial. And these aren't legal experts. They're former a-holes. They're on the left. They're on CNN and MSNBC. Quite frankly, some of the lawyers that, you know, we hear on our own uh, friendly network attacking this judge who's actually playing it straight, isn't she? She is single-handedly, single-handedly, Mark, taking all the slings and arrows. She, there is a woman in prison for making legitimate death threats against Aileen Cannon. But she is a lone wolf, a woman who is exposing all of the dirtiness, all the corruption, all the sloppiness of this case. And very few people are sticking up for her. I think that they will now. But to your point, all we see from the media are calls for her recusal, that she's compromised. And she has no business presiding over this case. There were two more interesting things that came out today, Mark, and I posted it also at uh, Twitter at Julie underscore Kelly too. Snippets. And by the way, Mr. Judy- Producer, let's link to that because she she needs to have these articles read as widely as possible. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. So, also part of the disclosure today was snippets from a grand jury proceeding. Now, Mark, you know this as an attorney. This was not happening during an FBI interview. Mm-hmm. One of DOJ's thugs, Julie Edelstein, is pressuring Tim Parlatori, Trump's, one of Trump's lawyers at the time, in front of a D.C. grand jury. Of course, none of this should have happened in D.C. Florida was the proper jurisdiction, but they conducted all of the investigation in D.C. so they could get whatever they wanted out of a D.C. grand jury. Same people who sit on a regular jury. Pressuring him to violate attorney-client privilege mm-hmm. and tell this grand jury about private conversations he had with the former president. And he got, he obviously pushed back on her efforts to do that, but she hinted that somehow there was a crime that he was covering up because he would not disclose to the grand jury these private privileged communications. Also what Donald Trump's team argued today is that David Ferrero, who was the archivist at the time, Obama appointee, started concocting a documents crime against Donald Trump the minute he left the Oval Office, dating back to January 20th, 2021. This is something else that Judge Cannon next month in a series of three days of hearings will consider publicly um, these accusations and evidence of collusion between the archives, the Biden White House, including the General Counsel's Office, the DOJ, FBI, and other entities in 2021, to concoct and manufacture some sort of documents, probably it looked like documents destruction case against Donald Trump. Mm -mm -mm. There's so much evil and, and diabolical activity with this guy, Jack Smith. And, of course, the question of his appointment is a very, very serious question. That is, under the appointments, this is my Bailey, what the appointments clause of the Constitution, when somebody has this kind of enormous power to conduct an investigation, to use the resources of the taxpayer, the Department of Justice, to have an unlimited number of investigators, FBI agents, uh, paralegals, uh, IT experts, and so forth and so on. You can't just pull anybody from the hag or from the street, any lawyer and so forth. This is an individual that had to go through the Senate Judiciary Committee, the Senate, be nominated and confirmed for this kind of what is considered a presidential position. The Attorney General of the United States had the ability to pick a sitting U.S. attorney, the way Bob Barr picked a sitting U.S. attorney as a special counsel. But you can't go around the appointments clause of the Constitution and say, oh, I got a real good hunter here, a real good hitman. He's got a real good history of cutting corners and going around and under the law, and I want him and say he's going to be my special counsel. You don't get to trump the Constitution. So this is being challenged in Florida. I, uh, you know, full disclosure, the Landmark Legal Foundation, of which I am chairman, but under the great tutelage of our president there, Pete Hutchison, they put together a killer brief by one of the greatest experts in the world on the appointments clause, and that's in front of the judge as well, correct? 
Correct. And again, to Judge Aileen Cannon's credit, this would not be happening in Judge Chutkin's courtroom in Washington, D.C. We know that. Judge Cannon just ordered a hearing on June 21st to hear exactly what you're saying, the unlawful appointment of Jack Smith that was first filed as an amici in the Supreme Court by former Attorney General Ed Meese. So on June 21st, Jack Smith and his team will have to defend themselves before this motion to dismiss based on the unlawful appointment of Jack Smith. And then that following after that weekend, three days of hearings related to the collusion between these entities, including the Biden White House that I just discussed. She is putting Jack Smith and the DOJ on trial. And this is the sort of courageous work of that we don't see from any other judge except for her. And she is the one really who should be commended for making all of this public because she really wants the American people to see what has happened in this investigation and prosecution. To further elaborate just a little on what you just said, we now have two former attorneys general, Edwin Meese and Mukasey, Mm -hmm. Mike Mukasey, both of whom have signed a brief with two brilliant law professors, one of whom is an old friend of mine, Calabrese, Stephen Calabrese, and Gary Locke. These are top-of-the-line, brilliant constitutional scholars, two former attorneys general, and, of course, landmark legal. But in terms of the, 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 the attack on this, this is not just some kook attack. This is a serious, serious challenge to the appointment. And it's... You know, Julie Kelly makes the point. There's not another judge who's hearing any of these cases who would even look at this. Chunkin's a joke, an absolute joke. She is basically the, in my view, Julie Kelly, the Juan Mershon of the January yeah. 6th case, where she basically rubber stamps everything the prosecution wants, no? Oh, she absolutely was. I mean, as you know, that case has been on indefinite hold since December. But she is the one who authored the history-making ruling that presidents are not immune from criminal prosecution. That is the question now before the Supreme Court. And as you know, that's the brief that um, Ed Meese filed saying the court shouldn't even consider this because it came, it originated from Jack Smith, who was unlawfully appointed. And Clarence Thomas, actually, during oral arguments, asked Trump's defense attorneys, if they made Jack's unlawful appointment part of their briefing in the immunity question, they had not. But that has now percolated over into the classified documents case, motion to dismiss based on his unlawful appointment. Judge Cannon is going to vet that publicly next month. So at some point, that's going to the Supreme Court, no matter how she rules, because somebody will appeal, go to the circuit court or emergency appeal to the Supreme Court between you and me. President Trump's lawyer should have included that, in my humble opinion. Julie Kelly, God bless you, my friend. <clears throat> Excuse me. Keep up the great work, and you're always welcome here. Will do. I'll be back in the courthouse tomorrow. People can follow my live reporting on Twitter, Julie underscore Kelly, too, and then I'll be posting this on my Substack. Mark, thank you so much for always having me on and covering my work. Well, Julie, that, that live reporting, Mr. Producer, let's, let's put that link up there, too. God bless you, Julie. Take care of yourself. She is fantastic, and she deserves support. Really, really does.